Hey there, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of The Dark Parade. My name is Bo. I am your host uh, for these proceedings. This is episode 34 of our main episodes of The Dark Parade. Uh, that is, of course, not counting all the found footage fools and hearts of horror and what you're watching. Uh, some Hero Hero Go Show stuff. Uh, basically, uh, we're just giving you stuff all the time for the low, low price of nothing. Anyway, <laughs> so welcome uh, to uh, the final episode of the May uh, calendar. This is Dagon by H.P. Uh, Lovecraft. If uh, if you weren't familiar with uh, that gentleman's work, uh, he is a an author who has written a bunch of ooey gooey sea creature old god stuff. And I was lucky enough when I decided to do the the horror under the sea and on the waves and all that stuff. When I decided to do this season, I wanted to make sure that uh, I included this movie because I just, it's one of those movies that sticks in my craw and I don't, I don't know that I especially like it, but it, it, you know, lives rent free in my brain as the kids say. Uh, so I wanted to talk about it and I knew that I wanted to talk about it with Brian and Jamie Sammons, Brian, of course, and we'll get to it in the introduction. But Brian has done a lot of writing uh, for the Call of Cthulhu tabletop role-playing game. He has edited a number of Lovecraft anthologies. Like He's a bona fide expert. One of the few we have on this show, because I certainly am not an expert on anything other than navel-gazing. You know, and Jamie, of course, is always welcome. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. I think we both, Jamie and I, frustrated him because of our foolishness at least once during the recording where he was trying to make a cogent and intelligent point and Jamie and I are giggling about whatever, you know, just like school children. Uh, so it, it's a good time, though, and you're, you're almost... Uh, g gonna accidentally learn something because Brian's just so smart and such a great authority on this. And we do have some interesting conversations along the way, aside from the foolishness that Jamie and I bring to the table. But the fact is, you just can't put us in a room together, even a, a virtual room such as the one we were on, without expecting a little bit of nonsense. And nonsense is, is what we got into. So, anyway, enough about that. Uh, I want to thank you all for... Uh, hanging in, especially with the the Moby Dick episode, uh, that which arguably might not have been horror, but I saw a number of people reaching out to say that, oh, you know, I'm going to go back and watch this movie. I've never seen it before. Or, I'm going to go back and watch this again. And honestly, that's kind of a lot of what this show is about is uh, trying to inspire a little bit of conversation. If not, just sitting down to watch a good movie. You know, there's, there's a, a few pleasures in life, I find. Uh, like like kicking back and watching a movie that really sucks into it. And I, I have that experience with Moby Dick, uh, among a lot of others that we've talked about uh, this season. So Deep deep Rising is always going to be a crowd pleaser for me. At any rate, uh, enough of my tomfoolery. Let's get to more of our tomfoolery with a look at uh, Stuart Gordon's Dagon with Brian and Jamie Salmon. So here we go. All right, folks, uh, a lot of you have asked, hey, is Jamie only going to be on the What You Watching episodes? And yes, we tried to contain her that way. Um, we tried <laughs> to keep her off of the main show, but she was undaunted. Uh, so undaunted was she that she even brought her husband. So, uh, yeah, I've got the nerve. <laughs> oh, why I ought to. Uh, I say to her all the time, but no, this is great because in a lot of ways, so it's obviously Jamie and Brian Sammons. Welcome, uh, to the, the actual podcast proper. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invite. Uh, well, thank, thank you very much. I mean, of course, when we talk about this movie, there is absolutely no one I want to talk about this movie with other, uh, than you guys, because, uh, I mean, just to get the bona fides out of the way, like Brian, you are, you, you have edited Lovecraft anthologies. You, you have written, um, campaigns for the, uh, it, I'm, I'm going to screw up the, the TTRG name. Go, go ahead. I'll shut up. You tell people what you did. 
It's for the Call of Cthulhu uh, role-playing game. It's like Dungeons and Dragons, but it's all based off Lovecraftian cosmic horror type stuff. Yeah, and and you, from what I understand, a really popular one. Uh, I do all right. Um, he's won awards. Don't <laughs> right. Don't let him be so humble. I. <laughs> it's a. Uh, it's something I still love doing. It's how I first broke into writing. Uh, they say write what you know, and well, this is what I knew. So I started here, and I still like to do it from time to time. I don't do it as much anymore as I used to, but I still, you know, whenever the mood hits me. Yeah. That's... We um we just recently watched where was that one from the playthrough? Oh yeah. He gets playthroughs uh from all over the world and they'll they'll like people will play through his campaign or even just review some of his campaigns or whatever and they'll post them on YouTube and then you know people send them to him and then we end up, end up watching them but we just watched a playthrough not too There long was ago. one I think uh... This might be the one you're thinking of, but I want to say it was Irish. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, so that's cool. Yeah. It's very cool. Also, Irish accents saying Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a good time. But yeah, that's one of the main reasons I keep doing this is I love the feedback from the players. Um, and especially now, I love that they'll do a YouTube channel about you know various role playing games and they'll run through my stuff and it's really neat to be able to see people in person play through what I wrote and see how they enjoy it and see what they do different because uh, when you write for a role playing game it's it's much different than writing fiction fiction you know the whole story in your head you can tell it however you want but games are by their nature interactive so you got to kind of try to think of all the stuff the other players might want to do and then try to cover to that and then you're always going to be surprised by something yeah so right that's like what i enjoy is the surprises but when somebody puts a little english on it you know gives their own little little twist to the narrative are there times too where you're like oh no you fucked it all up like well yeah, sometimes. Um, mostly, I'm just, ooh, I wouldn't do that. But, I mean, it's by the nature of the beast. A scenario for a role-playing game is kind of just like an outline. And I try to cover, like I said, all the bases, and I even give suggestions and hints on how to add or subtract different things to either broaden it or narrow it and stuff like that. But no matter what, there's always going to be other people's interpretation and then what they want to do with this material. So very much probably more so than writing stories or, you know, making a movie, not that I ever did that or anything like that. You really got to let it go and let other people play with it yeah. and change it how they want to. Let go and let the old gods, as the old saying yes. goes. Ah. Uh, we just watched a uh, review of one of his campaigns that is not mythos specific it was for i think it was still for call of cthulhu wasn't it, it was. but it was just outside the mythos and it was um I, I love this one because he based it off of well he was inspired by sonny bean and so the whole idea was that way up in northern and it took place in northern michigan which the upper peninsula yeah which uh you know yay um <laughs> and there was this cannibalistic family like living out in the woods and so we were watching a review of it and the guy who was doing the review review he had run the campaign several times and he's like oh one time i ran the campaign and my players weren't they didn't they didn't want they didn't go this way like they decided to go another way so i had to introduce this into the story and i was like oh that's cool you know that was a fun idea and then he said something else and i was like well now you just fucked it up like <laughs> i mean obviously he didn't you know you play a game how you want to play a game but um i, I was like er you know i was all i was like no that's not how it goes <laughs> but i mean brian's much more i mean he doesn't care but i'm very I'm very protective. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, it, you know, when I, when I was doing, when I was putting this season together, I wanted to do 
some movies about, you know, horrors of the deep. And finally, I get a name for this season. Damn, it always happens on like the second or third episode. Anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's <laughs> that's not your problem. That's my problem, folks. Um, but you, it was obvious, like, oh, I, you know, not that I don't love when Jamie is here, but it's like I got to get Brian for this at the very least. Um, oh yeah, I am definitely the hanger on here. This <laughs> is this is. I mean, I love Lovecraft, and uh, Innsmouth is my favorite Lovecraft story, mm -hmm. and the stories that I've written that have been Lovecraftian have been based on that you know or i've taken from that so you know I, i'm i'm here but brian is really the uh he's the one <laughs> he's he's the one that knows the shit <laughs> yeah so right and you know the what give us some of the campaign names just so people can can uh <laughs> can buy that but put a put a little cheddar in the pocket okay uh right now uh one of my Full length campaigns, think of that as like a novel, uh, came out through Chaosium. They're the people that own the rights to Call of Cthulhu, and they release the majority of stuff. And that's called A Time to Harvest. And then there's a. What Chaosium does is they let other companies print their own supplement material for this stuff, and they get a little piece of the action, of course, but it allows other people to do their things. And that book that Jamie was mentioning was released by Stygian Fox and it's called Occam's Razor. That's a pretty good name. That's probably my two most recent Call of Cthulhu things. And that yeah. one has what, six campaigns in it? Or how many? Yeah. Scenarios. Uh, oh, that's what I meant. Yeah, it has, I think, seven? Okay. Six or seven. You're clear. Yeah, something like that. And then A Time to Harvest, like I said, that's a novel. That is just one big scenario. It's broken up into chapters, but it's like a huge overarching thing. Those yeah. are pains in the asses to write, but... What oh, I love sure. is that when it comes to Brian's stuff, some of the comments I see most frequently are things like <laughs> uh, how gory they are, <laughs> how disturbing they are, <laughs> how, um, like, one guy said one time he had to sleep with the lights on after he played, <laughs> and I'm just... I'm I fucking love that. Oh, so that wonderful. If you, wonderful. Like, if you like the dark side and you're into Call of Cthulhu, or even if you're not, even if you're into other role-playing games and you want to branch out and try some Call of Cthulhu, I would definitely recommend looking up some Brian Salmon stuff. Yeah, I need to do that. We've been uh, we've been talking, some friends of mine and I, about doing a, a Shadowrun thing. Nice. Love Shadowrun. Um yeah it's the the first time i've done it so i'm kind of excited about it anyway well that that's on the other uh tabletop role-playing game podcast we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll get into the ins and outs of shadow run um <laughs> but yeah so as, as i was looking at doing the the horrors of the deep series i really wanted uh to talk about dagon uh or dagon depending on you know if you're listening to uh Brian Yesna say it or Stuart Gordon because they pronounce it differently and it drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, obviously I wanted, I, I wanted you guys on to talk about it, but also I wanted to talk about this movie in particular because it's what I find somewhat unsatisfying, but I can't stop thinking about it. When I think of like, Lovecraftian movies. Obviously, it it is almost. I'm I, I'm hard pressed to think of a movie that feels more purely Lovecraftian than Dagon. Uh, I might go with a recent Color Out of Space. Oh, sure, fair enough. Okay, yeah, the Richard Stanley movie is very. Yes. Yeah, that is very faithful. But prior to yeah, but you're right. But prior to that. It was sort of oh, like, yeah. even though Stuart Gordon had flirted and used Lovecraft stuff as a basis, and this is too, you know, we, we were talking a little bit pre-show about this, but um, this is not just, you know, here's the shadow over Innsmouth and we're done. It, it's a lot of embellishment. Yeah, he basically combined two of Lovecraft's stories. He combined the shadow over Innsmouth, that's the majority of this film, but he also included 
a story called, appropriately enough, Dagon. Yeah. But that is very, very lightly influenced in or represented in this movie. It's mostly, it's about 80, 90% uh, Shadow of Rinsmouth. Yeah. And I'm like Jamie. That's one of, if not my favorite stories, certainly one of them. I, mean, I oh, call I it, love it. Yeah. Call of Cthulhu is real good. But yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it is the prototypical. Hey, there's an old god. Here's the corruption of of the flesh and the corruption of this uh, somewhat isolated society. Um, but all right, so l- let's get into the plot. Uh, and uh, obviously, we're not going to go scene by scene here. But um, yell out if we need to stop and talk about any of this. Uh, but oh, I'm- one thing I was going to interject. I'm sorry. Uh, the when you were talking about pure pure Lovecraft, I think that one of well. Actually, there are two adaptations, or not not even adaptations, really. But one is The Resurrected. That's a good one. And That's that an is an excellent version of uh, Charles Dexter Ward. Mm-hmm. And then uh, The Lurking Fear uh, was adapted not not one-to-one, but I think Breeders yeah. um, is mm-hmm. a pretty good representation of the idea, at least the ideas. Yeah, kind of. It's a bit more monster movie silly. Yeah, oh, they, they, they lean into the to the googly eyed monsters, yeah. but it, the idea is there. And the lurking fear is another one of my favorite stories, just because it. I just think it has a really deep creep factor. But mm-hmm. anyway, sorry. Yeah, but yeah, like you were saying, most of them just aren't direct. At you know they'll, they're most of them are very loose. Well, because it's been uh, for years and years and years amongst Lovecraftian fans like me and such, it was pretty much common knowledge that we're never going to get a good Lovecraftian movie. Uh, He's one of the writers who he can tell a damn good story. On the page, it works great. You just can't see it translating to screen. Um, Nowadays, I think things are getting a little bit better. We're getting, I mean, there are Lovecraftian cosmic horror, weird fiction, whatever you want to call it, elements in a lot of stuff now. This is like a golden age to be a Lovecraftian fan. Mm-hmm. It used to be back in the 80s and so because Lovecraft's in the public domain, you can make any movie you want and just put HP Lovecraft's dot dot dot. And we've run across a lot yeah. of those. And you know you could just get away with that and the, the vast majority of them <laughs> were pretty damn bad. Uh, nowadays you could still use his name or his uh, stories or anything, however you wish, but they seem to be taking it a lot more seriously and they're, they're bringing a lot more love. Mm-hmm. I mean, Richard Stanley, for all his uh, possible alleged faults, mm-hmm. uh, he is a huge Lovecraft fan and he did an excellent job. And Stuart Gordon has always been a Lovecraft fan. I mean, there's certain people who just really embrace... John Carpenter is a huge Lovecraft fan. And just these people, uh, Guillermo del Toro. In fact, he is constantly... Or he was. And there's talk that he might come back to it again. But he's been trying to bring out uh, At the Mountains of Madness for years. Yeah. Oh, and, what I wouldn't get for his oh, Mountains of Madness would be so Right? Weird. That would be right? awesome. Yeah. Uh, Underwater was a good one. Yes, that was mm-hmm. a surprisingly good one. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it was sort of like a backdoor mm-hmm. uh, Lovecraft because you didn't know until the very end. And then you're like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, anyway. How dare you surprise me with an old god? Um, <laughs> All right. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. That, uh, that's absolutely valuable. Um, because, yeah, you're right. It, it is. It's. You know, uh, uh, what was the the made for HBO movie uh, cast a cast, cast a, deadly a deadly spell? spell. Yeah, a- another one that's kind of in that that ballpark. That's sort of this fantastic little movie. Oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I actually got him a cast a deadly spell T shirt for Christmas this Yay. year. Yay! Yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> I'm, I'm dating poorly. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so. um all right but let's get into this so we we, we've got uh essentially four characters to start with it's a guy named paul uh his girlfriend barbara uh and then vicky and howard howard wink wink right yeah 
and they're all on a boat uh, because they they had a dot com business that took off, and so Paul is sort of this job obsessed uh, kind of nerd. I know it, the actor kept saying Ezra Godden is, is the guy who plays it. Um, kept saying like, "Oh, I modeled all of my performance and look on uh, Harold Lloyd, this great silent film actor." And it's like, yeah, sure. But you didn't have to. It doesn't really matter to the movie, but whatever. Uh, well, in all honesty, I think he is modeled either his look or the, you know, his haircut with the glasses and the pale skin and all that stuff. I think Stuart Gordon wanted to have Jeffrey Combs. Yeah. He couldn't yeah. get That's, Jeffrey yeah. Combs, so this was the next best thing. Yeah, I said that while we were watching it this time, and I was like, I was like, you think he tried? Like, he really tried to find somebody who looked like Jeffrey Combs? And Brian's like, yeah, I've always thought that. Yeah. And it's, I think it's fairly obvious. Yeah. There are definitely moments in the movie where, you know, with the right lighting and that kind of thing, that he looks dead up like Jeffrey Combs. And yeah, yeah. it's startling. But uh, yeah, so our Jeff- or not Jeffrey Combs <laughs> is, <laughs> um, is on the boat with his girlfriend. His girlfriend gets pissed at him, throws... Uh, his laptop overboard to uh, to make him focus on a vacation, and they're they're kind of touring this area of Spain where his mother had hailed from. Um, but he is, you know, his, his mother's now deceased, and he's not really interested in the vacation at the end of the day. Um, but uh, he is also having visions of a uh, a doe eyed mermaid. Uh, at the the sort of mouth of this great uh, tunnel underwater, and um, you know, as he's wrestling with, he's having these visions. There's the, this dot com thing happening, and all of a sudden, this storm whips up and strands the boat, like uh, uh, pushes it against the rocks, strands the boat. Um, uh, out in the middle of the waters, they are they're close to a uh, a little fishing village named Imboca, and so uh, Paul and Barbara leave their friends Vicky and Howard on the ship uh, to go get help, essentially. And while they're gone. Vicky and Howard are she when when the 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 ship crashed into the rocks, uh, her leg got kind of pinned, um, I, under something like is it, it, it like it, it I know bl- her blood is leaking out of the boat. I think when the boat crashed into the rock, uh, it naturally you know staved in the side of the boat and it pressed her leg between. Uh, the boat and like a bed or something like that. She was pinned. Yeah. So she can't move. She's bleeding freely in one of the worst shots of the movie. You see the blood flowing out. It like the CGI in this movie is yeah. rough. It's it's you know, it's so it sad. wasn't even good at the time in, you know, 2001 when this came out and it's really aged poorly since. Yeah. And that's a shame, but it's also the truth. Yeah, I, you know, I'm not one to uh, discredit a movie entirely for the special effects. I'm, I'm a big fan of the saying, like, nobody left a theater whistling the special effects. So it, yeah. it, it doesn't huh. sink a movie, but... <laughs> pun. Um, it doesn't sink a movie, but in a movie like this, there are a couple of really egregious instances where you're yeah. like, oh, well, that just looks like garbage. Uh, yeah. And Meanwhile, the practicals, I think, look fantastic. Yeah, some really fun stuff. And I think that's what makes the CGI feel especially traitorous yeah. in this movie, is that there's a lot of good practical work. And then you'll see, you know, this shot of blood flowing into the water. The waves look terrible. And the blood doesn't look good. And this is another movie where... You know, on DVD, maybe you got away with that a little more, but in in the age of high def, uh, you know, boy, you can see the pimples. Well, a little behind the scenes of this, uh, back in the late 80s, I remember uh, I had a Fangoria 
and in it they were talking about Stuart Gordon doing The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Mm -hmm. And even back then he wanted to do this movie. And they were talking about what they wanted to do and how they wanted to bring this vision to life. He even hired Bernie Wrightson, who's an amazing artist, to do concept drawings that the actual effects were going to be based off of. They showed some of the rough uh, effects and it just, it looked amazing, but ultimately uh, nobody would fund it. In, in order for them to do it justice, they needed X amount of money, more than they had for uh, From Beyond or a Reanimator and just nobody wanted to do it. Yeah. Which, and, didn't those do well? They did well, but it didn't do super well. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they made their money, they made a profit, but I don't know why. I would have bet on Stuart Gordon doing another kick-ass movie. Yeah, but it, because of that, I mean, just real quick, that's why this movie took so long to come out. That's why when it finally came out, it was set in Spain, specifically for financial reasons. Um, other than Ezra Godin, I'm pretty sure everybody else in this movie is Spanish. And they do a you know a wonderful job, but it's just it's all these economic factors that added to this movie's plight, I guess. And part of that is CGI. Yeah. I mean, there is good CGI and there's not so good CGI. And the really good CGI, CGI costs a hell of a lot of money. Right. Yeah, just because Jurassic Park was, you know, six years before this. Yeah. Doesn't mean you're getting Jurassic Park money. Yeah. Um, and, it, and that stuff, too, makes it feel a little chintzy. It and, does. And and I, I also have a problem with the music in this movie, I think is particularly bad. Um, uh, it's I think it's very generic. Yeah, to yeah. me it's almost like a non event. It's just kind of there. Yeah. It's like, you know, what can we find in a library mm -hmm. that now I do found I do find myself after the movie was over, I found myself humming the score a little bit. But it was more, it wasn't because, oh my God, that's an amazing score. It was just more because I'd heard the same things over and over and over again because they, they really do just kind of loop it around mm -hmm. and it just sort of drilled its way into my brain. But yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, the the music could have been much better and it just sounds very generic. Mm. It, it yeah. feels very, very synthy, but not in, like you said, it almost feels like there was an audio library that they were borrowing a lot of this music from. Instead of, you know, uh, you know, we talked about Carpenter earlier, but, you know, his Lovecraft movie is, I mean, aside from The Thing, which is more Lovecraftian than I think people give it credit for, but uh, something like we it. We do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but For years, I've always said it is the most Lovecraftian movie ever made, not by Lovecraft. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, nowadays there's some stiff competition. It's still my favorite movie of all time, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, so there's a lot more there. Very smart guy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, something like Prince of Darkness has a very Lovecraftian vibe to it as, as oh, well. Yeah. And, of course, In the Mouth of Madness. But those use that same kind of Carpenter minimalist scores, but mm -hmm. in just so much better ways. And I think this movie could have benefited from a little bit of restraint in the score. Um, as opposed to like this kind of choral stuff, especially yeah. towards the end that I don't think really comes off all that well. Uh, but that's, you know, there, that's a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking for this movie. But, um, anyway, so, so Paul and Barbara go into shore, uh, Vicky and Howard staying behind and, uh, something comes to get them. We don't see what that is, but I, I presume later we are to understand it is the citizens of the town who come to get them? Well, initially, something bubbles up out of the water, and they're all, ah! And later, when we uh, meet the one woman who survived her encounter, she mentions how something pulled her husband underwater and drowned him. Yeah. So, something actually happened to him, supernatural, but yeah, then the townsfolk came out there, grabbed him, and brought him in. And yeah, because we see at least his skin later, so yeah. he was they retrieved him at least, but yeah, so uh, Barbara, I will see your face again, but you will not see mine. I do love that, <laughs> I <Yeah>. do too. <laughs> um, <laughs> so 
uh, Barbara and Paul reach the shore. Paul is entirely useless in this movie uh, up, until, <laughs> uh, uh, up until he's not. Uh, but at first, he you know he doesn't speak the language. He holds no currency, um, to quote Paul Simon. And then he uh, it's Barbara who kind of arranges this, like, oh, the, we have these fishermen who are in no way creepy, by the way. <laughs> One thing I will uh, mention, I guess right here, as good as yeah, but enough place as any, is did you notice that every single inhabitant of this town with the exception of the you know one purely purely human guy and of course the newcomers nobody ever blinks yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i love that it, i it, love that it's a really nice touch like there, there is a creep factor to this movie and i think it's most successful as a film when you're in the lead up to that Yes. Uh, like these moments where, you know, you see that the local, uh, you know, priest or whatever, who as he's, you know, basically negotiating like, oh, Paul's going to go out to the boat. Barbara's going to stay in town. And he points to the local hotel and you realize like, oh, he's got webbed fingers. Well, that's <laughs> yeah. unpleasant. Or when uh, Dario Argento behind the hotel counter <laughs> turns around and you see his neck. And and then he also has those little thing like little almost like know, barnacles kind of his, yeah <laughs> on his head and that I I love the special effects the the practicals in this film but they gross me out <laughs> and they do like it just bleh, you know and they the, did their job yeah no they did but yeah there is a definite ick factor with even with the the garbly voices that mm -hmm. they have the way that they sort of slouch when they walk everything looks wet all the time i mean yeah. it's raining but even the people just are just slimy the town the set dressing is amazing in this movie yeah. i mean this whole thing just reeks of rot and decay mm -hmm. which if you ever read the lovecraft story that is so perfect for that that is the essence of the story and it's really on display here I mean, I love when Ezra finally gets to the hotel and he's searching over his room. I love the line where he's like, like I don't fucking think yeah, so. Yeah, I don't fucking think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it looks like it's been underwater. Yeah, you know? it's, just, it's just, it's just nasty. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I know that there are some interviews with the actors who are clearly not having a great time because of Stuart Gordon just being like, it's got to rain. It's everything's wet. And they're like, this is disgusting. Like I've got <laughs> five different kinds of fungus now, uh. but, but yeah, it. so all of that stuff really works. Like, you know, uh, he goes out to the boat. It turns out that they're missing. So he just comes back to town and Barbara's gone. And, you know, from his jaunt with these weirdos, uh, on the boat who are, you know, like Gorton's fishermen, only they look like they're half fish already. Yeah. And uh, like you said, he, you know, he goes to this hotel room where he's going to wait out Barbara. And as he does, he, he, you know, the, all of a sudden a bunch of these limping, misshapen people start wandering the streets and coming for him essentially and there's a, a scene that's you know taken from the story where he he realizes oh there's no lock on the door and the people are coming and so he's trying to, it, i don't think this totally works because even no. if <laughs> even if he gets this you know uh a latch screwed onto the door it's this little chintzy latch that yeah, you could just yeah. push right in. So yeah, why? I was like, we don't have time for that. You don't it's have time for that. Put the, the fucking effort. chair yeah. in front of the door. Like something. Move some furniture. That's not going to do it. I <laughs> I also like when they start pounding on the door and he's his response is like occupado. Um, <laughs> you know, when I was a when I was a teenager, I had exactly the same kind of slide lock on my bedroom door. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it was. I don't know. And I remember I got into a, like an argument with my dad one time and I went in my bedroom and I slammed the door and I locked it and he just came in after me like because he wasn't done yelling at me. Yet, so he came in after me and he didn't even he opened the door. The lock flew yeah. off the door and hit my mirror and he was like, 
was that door locked? And I was like, <laughs> um. But he didn't even notice. Like, that's how, that's how ineffective it was, is he just opened the door. And the lock just went flying across the room. So yeah, th- those are like vanity locks. They're not going to give you any security whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. And, but it does stop these people, strangely. Or uh, at, yeah. at least long enough. For or, a minute, yeah. Well, yeah, so Paul kind of hightails it out the window onto this roof, and he ends up falling and hurting his leg. And I know that Gordon, uh, I think, has said um, that this is sort of the beginning of the, the... Well, not the beginning, but one of the elements of foreshadowing that you know he now moves like these townspeople that maybe paul is uh in some way connected to these people oh i will also say just sorry for the interruption no. but in the very very beginning when he's on a boat with his girlfriend and you know she's trying to get some sexy time going and she takes his shirt off starts kissing all over him did you notice the bruises on the side of his ribs yeah yeah yeah, yeah, they're they're yes again because Stuart Gordon knows how to make a movie. Yes, and for all the flaws that this movie has, and there there are several, there are moments like that when you go back to this movie where you're like, oh yeah, they're really not totally tipping their hat uh, their hand. No, but, but they're just there. laying the foundation. I love that. Yeah, I uh, love when a movie earns it. You know, instead of just pulling, you didn't see that coming, did you? No. He, lay the foundation, lay the breadcrumbs so if I watch it a second time, I can see, okay, everything was honest. You know, they really did did the homework. Yeah, and there there's also a, kind of a mirror, I mean, we haven't gotten to this scene yet, but it, you know, while we're on the subject, there is a mirror of the, that scene when he and Barbara are in bed at the beginning where she's, you know, kind of rolling over on him and getting, you know, sexy time and rubbing his side. It, it, there is a mirror of that scene with Paul and uh, Ushia, the our mermaid lady, mm-hmm. um, where he does the same thing, only you know where Barbara just finds Paul's you know bruises. Um, then you know there is a discovery of uh, you know Ushia later, but um, yeah. So there's there there's definitely stuff in this movie that is all about. Hey, we're you know, uh, th- there is something going on with Paul more than just him being the beleaguered, you know, final girl of the movie running around. Um, but speaking of him running around, he he's being chased through the streets by these you know misshapen people, runs into what turns out to be a tannery, where he finds a bunch of racks with human skin on them. And as he is being cornered, he ends up kind of turning over, you know, this tanning fluid or whatever and starting a fire to mask his escape. And he gets away. And um, he ends up... (laughs) He ends up getting away by grabbing, like, a rack of a a human, you know, uh, skin stretched over this rack and just carrying out, like, oh, yeah, I'm just helping get rid of this. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> meanwhile looks absolutely nothing like any of the villagers but they don't seem to notice because i guess you know being a fish person you figure they might notice the bright orange miskatonic sweatshirt he's wearing when everybody in town is wearing you know grays blacks you know? yeah he might as well have glow sticks stuck in his ears yeah everybody else in town is slumping around like the elephant man and he's just like Ta-da! You know, with his glasses and his clean cut haircut and his bright orange sweatshirt i mean you know it would have been a good he should have put on one of those faces and mm-hmm. and like found a big coat and he could have just walked right out yeah try to do but, some kind of uh like te- texas chainsaw massacre yeah. two kind of thing yes exactly um, <laughs> yes. You could even build him a little fry house. You're the best, Leatherface. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So he he ends up uh, running into uh, you know veteran actor uh, Pablo Francisco, and 
uh, who is, you know plays this old dude who lives in town and uh, is seemingly unaffected by all of the you know the the other transformations going on in this village and understandably paul is like so what the fuck is going on around here and where are all my friends etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh he he tells them essentially that you know here is the backstory uh or i'm sorry francisco Rabal uh, uh gave the wrong name but francisco Rabal, uh who who plays a character named ezekiel who gives them the backstory of this village which um, long story short, the the village had fallen on hard times. Uh, it was a fishing village, and no fish were being caught. And so this dude rolls into town and says, Hey, I think I've got a way <laughs> that we can uh, turn this thing around. And that's instead of worshiping uh, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, have you heard the good news about Dagon? <laughs> and if we throw this, you know, the eye of Dagon into the water and say these prayers, then he will bless this village uh, with, you know, fish and, and money and that kind of thing. And uh, and sure enough, they do. The The town decides that sounds fine to us. And they uh, they end up, uh, you know, turning the, sur the, the church into the... Um, you know this society of Dagon worshippers, and sure enough, the fish come back and they start to get gold crabs washed up on the shore, uh, which also look kind of chitsy. Yeah, they are not great props. Um, but the town is ecstatic, with the exception of Ezekiel and his parents, who are like, "This is fucked up. Like, we don't want any part of this because of." Uh, you know, the ho hoary elder gods and whatnot. And I love when he's telling that story and he's like, and he's, you know, you, you kind of, you're watching the flashback as he's telling the story and you see him as a little boy looking out a window and he's like, wish I'd never heard, wish I'd never seen. And it just, that story just breaks my heart. And then when he gets done and the guy's like, okay, there are two options. You're either drunk or crazy. And I'm like, dude, he just poured his heart out to you. And I'm over here crying, <laughs> but it just, it's so sad. Wait, it, this it, movie made you cry? Just that. Every movie makes you know, cry. <laughs> just that moment. Because Ezekiel has, because Ezekiel has a tear running down his face and it just, it made me sad. All right. Um, <laughs> I, that's okay we were watching a YouTube video about Endgame yesterday and when it gets to the, they were talking about when um, oh Iron Man. Iron Man sacrifices himself and I just started bawling <laughs> Brian's like oh good lord <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it <laughs> I, I can't say too much because I rolled a tear in that last Spider-Man movie and <laughs> uh, you know. I did too. Yeah. Oh, heartbreaking. Anyway, and it wasn't the scene you think. Uh, it was uh, the Andrew Garfield thing. Um. Anyway. So yeah. So Ezekiel's parents now are, you know, like we're gonna steer clear of this, even though the whole town is now filled with Dagon worshippers. And anyway, but things start to turn south. And where, the, you know, there aren't as many fish coming, there's not as much gold coming. And so they decide, oh, well, we've got to uh, do some sacrifices. And um, so the women are going to be given over to Dagon, not, not necessarily to be killed, but to be mated with so that there will be, you know, fish people and whatnot. And then the men are, are murdered for blood sacrifice. And so that's, you know, sort of why these people are the way they are. They are the offspring of the women of the town in Dagon. And uh, so eventually, you know, they will all eventually go back to the sea and serve their master and, and whatnot. And, and this guy, along with Paul, are kind of the last people who are not somewhat influenced by Dagon left in the village. 
And uh, so, you know, they and, and Ezekiel says, like, the only reason they leave me alone is because I'm just a drunk and I'm not a threat to them. So they just don't care and they let me go about my business. And so Paul realizes, like, oh, shit. So Barbara is now going to be the mate of a elder fish god. And Ezekiel's like, yeah, kind of, pretty much. Also, yeah, that other lady on the boat, uh, her too. And uh, and so Paul is like, okay, well, you've got to lead me to them and, and help me rescue them. And so Ezekiel gets on board, basically does a, a, a diversion to let Paul sneak into the mansion of the mayor. Um, where he is pretty much immediately captured because Paul kind of sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's not very good at the getting away and I through the whole movie because there's a lot of that a lot of him running and trying to get away and he's just not good at it and I told Brian I'm like look stop fucking around with the car stop trying to go into random buildings because that's that never ends well just run yeah just go just get the hell out these fish people can't catch you they're too slow so just go Get out of yeah, town. Find a go road and follow it. Yeah. It, it'll lead somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, head away from the sea. That is yeah. the, the mm -hmm. best advice that uh, Paul could follow is get get to dry land and stay there. Uh, but instead, he ends up getting captured. He is thrown into uh, this barn where he discovers Vicky and Barbara. And he saw at the tannery, he saw Howard's skin stretch. So... He's, he's done for. And Barbara seems fine. Vicky, on the other hand, is like, oh no, there, there was this horrible creature that attacked us, and uh, he did something to me. And Paul's like, well, what happened now? What's going on? And Ezekiel's like, he fucked her. Are you not paying attention to the stories I'm telling you? <laughs> and he says it just like that, too. He's like, and he fucked her. Yeah. <laughs> I also love it. He is very no nonsense because when Barbara is, uh, sorry, when Vicky is going on about, you know, what she saw or, you know, all anything. And then Barbara's trying to calm her down. And she's like, well, I'm sure they gave you some medication for the pain and it made you hallucinate. You know, it was just a dream. And Ezekiel's like, it's no dream. And they're like, shut up. <laughs> You're fucking it up. Shut up. <laughs> Frank, wait, look. You know that this is a fish god cult. I know it's a fish god cult, but we're trying to calm her down. Yeah, so, <laughs> she doesn't need to know that right now. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, so he ends up cutting Vicky free, um, and Barbara, and they're they're all going to, you know, escape together. But again, immediately they are surrounded by fish people, and. Uh, Vicky holds a knife uh, to her gut and is like, hey, if you guys come any closer, I'm going to kill the fish baby I got in my belly. And all the, you know, freaky uh, Dagon fish people are telling her like, no, no, no. Uh, this is a, a great honor for you to bear the child of Dagon. And uh, Vicky remains unconvinced of that and ends up killing herself. And so Paul and Ezekiel kill one of these guards and start to run off and then are immediately recaptured. Yeah. Because he sucks. Yeah. Not, uh, and like, Barbara's screaming, don't let him take me, Paul. Don't let him take me. And I'm like, good luck with that. He's not good at this. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. She is far more capable than he is. I'm guessing they are... They were trying to go with the everyman thing where, you know, he's not a soldier. He's not a cop. He's probably lived his whole life, never even been in a fist fight or something like that. He does come into his own later. So there is a bit of a character turn. But yeah, in the beginning, he is just useless. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, I think the problem with his character is that you because you're just left with him because Barbara kind of skates out of the movie for the, the most part and she's definitely the character that seems to have you know a little bit of get up and go at her a little bit of yeah. fight and but she's not in the movie enough for you to root for her and so you're left yeah. with Paul and he's tough to root for until the very end of the movie 
and you just needed a little bit more of like ingenuity and and a little bit of diehard out of Paul, as weird as that is to say, like somebody that maybe he wants to avoid contact with these things, but just make them a little bit more clever or a little bit more uh, substantial. So that he does a few things that I like early on. Uh, I like when he's noticing the hotel uh, innkeeper that he's not blinking. Argento. Yeah, Argento. That he's not blinking, so he's like trying to get him to blink. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's funny. He's, yeah, like, when he's like winking his eyes. <laughs> I like, well, bringing up Barbara when at one point when she first goes to the hotel and she's like, you know, begging him to let her use the phone and call the police and he's just standing there unblinking unmoving just staring straight at her which is very unnerving mm -hmm. by the way like that's a very it's it's just unsettling and at one point she grabs for the phone and he grabs for her in return and she like goes to smack him away but she goes she's like going over the counter mm -hmm. at him and i'm like get him like you know she i mean she's got balls yeah. you know she's she's a little spitfire i i love the idea of you yelling get him <laughs> that is the thing that happens <laughs> and the other thing I like that Paul does early on is in one of the many times he gets captured uh, he's rolling around with this guy next to a car and oh. having a fight so he grabs his cell phone and then starts beating a guy with his cell phone <laughs> he's like I need to get a bigger cell phone I know which is you know an Arnold Schwarzenegger like one liner okay sure but I like the idea that he, he brought the phone out and used it as a weapon well was and smart. the same thing with the hubcap too yeah. later on like he he does have his moments of ingenuity but there are a few and far between oh and the toilet seat uh tank lid mm -hmm. yeah so. with the, the kid has, uh, speaking of the the telephone thing though um there that was a, a little bit of real life that found its way into the movie because i think it was brian yusna and his wife who were tooling around and got uh held up you know basically were being carjacked and his wife basically beat the would-be carjacker into submission with her cell phone and, wow. and, awesome. and actually made the statement i should ha i should have a, a bigger cell phone <laughs> and, good on her man yeah and so when they were making the movie they were like well let's throw that line in the movie so that that came from a real a real thing no, that's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, edutainment is what we strive for here on the show. Um, so, getting back to the story, they end up uh, uh, being captured again. There's a guy that's going to start skinning them and, in fact, does uh, skin Ezekiel as uh, he and Paul um, recite the Lord's Prayer. In, in which is a pretty brutal scene oh god I, I i'm cringing i was had my eyes covered well i'm peeking through my fingers but it counts and uh, it just that one really get that particular scene really really gets me because flaying to me is one of the worst we've even talked about this on a previous episode of ours where you know the, the question was you know what do you think is the worst way to die and i think being flayed is the worst way yeah, to die. Right up there. I mean, yeah. that to me is just uh, god awful. And so watching that, and it's a pro like a prolonged, slow. Just they show you every bit of it scene, and it just ugh, like <laughs> ugh, it runs all over me. It's so good. Yeah, it's 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 a great effect too. It looks good. Oh yeah, yeah, it looks great. And that, I think that that's where they put a big chunk of their money in. <laughs> It, uh, that's one of the best looking effects in the whole movie. Oh, for sure. Uh, so Paul is next on the chopping block. And meanwhile, Barbara has been taken away. She is, uh, you know, obviously going to be given over to Dagon. And uh, Paul is uh, about to be skinned when somebody comes in and is like, no, 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 no. Take him to the house. Uh, we, have, uh, we have other plans for Paul. And so he tries to get away again once he's led to the house. But again, because Paul sucks at this, <laughs> he he ends up running into a, a bedroom where he runs into 
Ushia, who is the the woman that you know he's been having visions of this mermaid that he he keeps imagining, and she seems one of the things I like about this is she seems as surprised as him that he's real. And there is sort of an implication that she has been having visions of her own that include him. And, yeah, I think so. Uh, but sure enough, they uh, inevitably start making out because what else are you going to do in this scenario? And and also, she is telling him, you know, like, oh, I know you have dreamed of me. I have dreamed of you. Let's get down. Uh, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> Not by much. I was pretty dead on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and oh, also there, this guy uh, peeks in for a second who's like really hideously deformed and is like, hey, are you in there alone? She's like, yes, Papa, I am here. It's just me. And he's like, all right, you're not you're not hiding a distant relative or anything in there, are you? She's like, no, Papa, just me. And my tentacles. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so as they, as they start to make out after the mayor of the town leaves, um, you know, and again, this is that mirror of the original scene with him and Barbara, and he discovers that below the waist she is all tentacle and fish. And Yeah, that'll Paul, ruin a mood. You're either into it or you're not, and Paul is not. I guess he's not a hentai fan. Uh, no. <laughs> so, he doesn't watch anime. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he flips out and runs, uh, even as she calls after him. And um, he ends up, you know, dodging some more villagers, gets in a car, runs that off the road, uh, and then ends up finding some refuge into this flooded house. And also in a moment that I really, really like in this movie there's a kid uh, that scares him initially and he's like hey kid can you help me get out of here and then this you know mutant fishman comes out of this flooded water uh, in this house and attacks him and Paul ends up killing the guy uh, but the kid is distraught you know because this was his yeah. grandfather mm -hmm. yeah and I really, really dig that. And he just looks dead at him. You killed him! You know? Um, and uh, after he's... Although, I probably would have punched that kid out as he's like, that's not a key! That's not a key! And I'd be yeah. like, oh, you little shit, shut up! Right. <laughs> I don't, my Spanish isn't good. What is... It? Oh, here! Oh, damn it. Okay. <laughs> so, so he ends up uh, running back into town and he's trying to find Barbara again um, and decides he's going to go to the church uh, where he's got this, you know, can of kerosene and he's got to, you know, burn the, the Dagon worshippers out. But uh, it turns out the church uh, is, is all empty, but there is a hidden passageway. And so Paul follows this uh, hidden passageway down into the actual room where Dagon is worshipped. And I don't know that I like the direction in this scene very much, but I think the scene itself is really cool. Because it's a bunch of fish people wearing human skin as sort of like, you know, hey, remember when we were people, but we're not anymore. And mm -hmm. dancing around doing their, you know, uh, yeah, yeah chants as Barbara is being held over an open pit in the nude. And, um, you know, and in comes Ushia, who is sort of the princess, the Dagod princess of this town. Yeah, it seems whatever she says goes. Well, she is the mayor's daughter, and they very much have like they're like the royalty of this town yeah. so yeah she would be the princess then. well and the headdress that she wears is is um golden like, spiky if it, well not that one <laughs> but the one that she wears before that sort of looks like a span like spanish royalty mm, would wear. yeah and you know she's yeah so she's like she i mean she just walks into a room and everybody does whatever she says so 
Oh, uh, the spiky she's hat is real cool. silly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it kind of is. <laughs> it is... kind of is. <laughs> that is also not great. I'm sure on paper that sounded fantastic. It just doesn't come off very well. Um, but yeah, yeah. so uh, she starts to chant and, and so forth. And then Barbara is lowered down into the pit as Paul, who has been captured, of course, uh, yet again, <laughs> is forced to watch. And, you know, Barbara is all uh, piss and vinegar until uh, they pull her up from the water. And uh, she uh, does not seem pleased about what has happened. She's been inked. Yeah. Which sort of suggests like, oh, Dagon got to her and she is now, you know, pregnant yeah. with fish baby. And that was fast. He's a he's a fast one. <laughs> he's a... She wasn't down there that long. I mean, she wasn't down there long enough to drown. So, you know, she he he works pretty fast. But I think she says when Paul hauls her back up, doesn't she say, "Kill me"? Yeah, yeah. Well, because she made him promise, "Look, if they take me away, I don't want them to do to me what they did to Vicky." Mm -hmm. So, you know, if it comes down to that, you've got to kill me. And of course. Because Paul sucks, he can't do it. <laughs> so, so he's trying to get her free. He doesn't you know? He's not going to kill her because Paul's not that kind of guy. Um, but before he can free her, we get our one and only look at Dagon, and it's horrible. <laughs> it's yeah, it's real. This is another moment of CGI where you're like just you should not have shown this. No. You know, like, have a practical tentacle grab her and yank her down and be done with it. Don't... Because it, it... it It's very silly. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like a big one-eyed octopus thing. It looks a little bit like the... Uh, the Kandarian theme at the end of Evil Dead 2. Mm, a little, yeah. With more but more tentacles. importantly... If you are a Lovecraftian fan, uh, Dagon in the story and all the mythology and all that looks nothing like that. So they don't even get him right to the source material. This is something they just made up and went with. What's the and, what's Dagon supposed to look like? I don't even remember. It's been so long since oh, I've read that. Uh, essentially, almost like the creature from the Black Lagoon, but just huge. He is a giant thing. I think... Um, kind of like the um, the the Kraken from the 81 Clash of the Titans. Not even that. He doesn't have tentacles at all. Not everything Lovecraft wrote No, he tentacles doesn't have it. tentacles. No, Dagon in this movie does. No, I know. I'm saying the Kraken doesn't have tentacles. Well, it's like those tentacle arms. He just yes. has arms. I, doesn't he have like four of them? And they're like all wiggly and shit? They're just arms. They're, they're not tentacles. They're just arms. He's just a big... He looks like a big reddish colored creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah, huh. it, it, it brings me no joy to say that Jamie is right on this okay. one. <laughs> but, I always thought he had like four, you know, he had hands at the end of his arms, but they were like extra long and extra like boneless. I must be thinking of something totally different. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I had this sticker guy, this rubber toy when I was a kid that had really long floppy arms with suction cups out. He was like suction cup man or something like that. He kind of looked like that. Okay. <laughs> Maybe that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking of the toy <laughs> that, that Jamie had. You know what? In <laughs> fairness, I, I look, I think, I think everybody's right here because in fairness... <laughs> They are kind of tentacly. Uh, uh, I think I thought they were just arms. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm remembering it incorrectly. I'm going. I, I, all right. Uh, just to. I will concede that I could be. Uh, I mean, it doesn't ever happen, but I could be wrong. I'm going to see if we can't. <laughs> uh, uh, link. Boom. This. I was right. I was right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Just Look at how they bend. Well, okay, so they're bending. And he has arms, four of them. Still arms. Damn, I love being right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they're just arms. No, they're all <laughs> floppy. And he has four of them. Well, I didn't say he didn't have four. I just said they were arms. I mean, look at that. There's no bones in there. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Um, okay. 
I, yeah, I, I would have, like I said, I was siding with you, Jamie, until I took a look at it. I was like, oh, yeah, sure enough. They are, they, I still they're hands. Call them tentacles, though. They're, they're tentacles of hands at the end. They're just bendy arms. They're okay. hanticles. <laughs> uh, or, ah. or, or tentaclaws. Ooh, I like, I like that. that. <laughs> uh, so, anyway. None of those things. That would be way better than what it is, which is this CGI mess. And so Barbara is now eaten? Yeah, I don't... I mean, that doesn't... That seem kind of... I don't know what he did with her, because doesn't... Wouldn't that seem counterproductive, considering yeah, what he I mean, just did? He wants to make babies. I don't know. It's a cool moment, because he jumps up, grabs her, and then next thing you know, you see her hands hanging onto the bar yeah but nothing else <laughs> yeah no i do like that moment it just i even at the time though i was like is did he eat her is he taking her so, i'm i think he needs her right i mean they stressed that I mean, when paul was trying to bargain for them to let barbara go and uh hey macarena was like no he needs her you know there hasn't we haven't had a sacrifice in over a year, and you know we need to we need to have these babies. So if it was that important, you think he would have? Dagon got a case that. of the blue balls. You would not believe. Yeah. <laughs> I've got it stuck in my head now. As soon as you said that she was taken, I want to I want to see Liam Neeson doing <laughs> the like, listen to me, Barbara. You're about to be <laughs> taken by a fish god. <laughs> Yeah, if Paul had uttered the words, I have a very specific set of skills or whatever, I would have been like, bullshit, your skill is getting caught. Yeah, so speaking of, after setting a couple of these dudes on fire and whatnot, he just gets caught again. Again! And, <laughs> and they're about to murder him, but he is saved by a deus ex fishman who just kind of... I, uh, yeah, I like the makeup on that guy. Yeah. Who strolls out and is like, that is my son. And and sure enough, it turns out that like this mother that Paul talked about at the beginning of the movie was from Mboka, uh, and she left and, and went off, you know, to, to live out in the world. But uh, technically, Paul is the brother of Ushia. Which and, is hot. Yeah, it, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's a real... You two are you born kind of thing. Uh, You're my brother. We'll be lovers forever. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and as a more example of good foreshadowing, uh, they do mention early on when they're when they're all together on the boat in the very beginning. Uh, he says something like, "Yeah, my mom came from you know from here, but she never wanted me to come here. In fact, she didn't want me to learn Spanish. So that's yeah. why I didn't know any Spanish. And that kind of you know sets this whole up." Yeah, she was trying to keep you from coming back. I like the idea that he just, you know, had a a, a phrase book or something like "Donde esta el," and she just smack it out of his hand. <laughs> How dare I told you, don't ever learn Spanish. But yeah, but I was watching Sesame Street. <laughs> but, but mom, it's the second most popular language in this country. <laughs> How dare you be bilingual? You you will learn a dead romance language, Latin or nothing. <laughs> and don't you dare extrapolate that to the other romance languages like Italian, French, and Spanish. Um, I'm not going to tell you why, but you're just not going to. Right, right. I don't want you to understand any uh, telenovelas. I don't want you watching any of that stuff. <laughs> not a poor guy just has to walk around putting O at the end of everything. Oh, yeah. Mm. Rumo, please, O. Rumo, please, O. <laughs> Upstairs, O. <laughs> It's like these people have a different word for everything. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, Paul, after this revelation that he is actually, you know, one of, one of the townspeople, really, um, he grabs his can of kerosene and douses himself in, in this uh, flammable liquid sets fire to himself rather than exist as a fishman. But uh, Ushia, our high priestess of Dagon, uh, jumps and, you know, basically knocks him down this giant well into the water. 
and he we see the both of them underwater. She's of course perfectly at home because she's a tentacle lady. Um and I need to put that in the tags for this show so that I get more listens. Tentacle lady. Uh, yeah. Um and <laughs> Paul is this crispy critter. Uh, because he's all, you know, horribly burned because of, of setting fire to himself. But then, uh, on his sides where we saw the, the bruises before gills open up and he realizes like, oh, I can breathe underwater. And then he they seems pleased about it. You know, he doesn't seem upset. Well, like he's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause now he's going to go hang out with this sexy tentacle lady and they swim off together and the the screen uh starts to fade and we get the insert of you know we shall swim out to that brooding reef in the sea and dive down through the black abysses to cyclopean and many columned yaha and flay and in that layer of the deep ones we shall dwell amidst wonder and glory forever and and end of movie uh, and, yeah. and apologies to Dagon worshippers for m- mispronouncing Yahai and Pele. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Thulu words. Yeah. It's, it's okay. I, whenever I come across them, I just, if I'm reading aloud and I come across Cthulhu words, I just say Cthulhu words. Because, mm-hmm. yeah. I like, uh, is it uh, Pathang? I like that one. That's a pretty good one. <laughs> I like Fatagan. Photogen. Yeah, <laughs> Photogen is, is pretty good stuff. <laughs> now, here's my question. does he, he Is he going to get to heal, or is he going to be all flaky and crispy for eternity? Well, I mean, he's still going to go through a change, so who knows? He might metamorphosize into something else. During Eventually, the they all become... Yeah. Uh, this movie does a very poor job of illustrating the whole idea of the Deep Ones and who they are. Like this... The plot of this movie is, you know, women are given a Dagon, Dagon bones them, they have, ba- you know, baby fishmen and all that. That's not from the story. Uh, there's, like, a whole separate race out there, and they're the main focus of Innsmouth. And uh, Dagon is, like, their god, but he's, like, you know, once removed from the action. He doesn't even take, he doesn't even show up in the story. He's hardly mentioned in the story other than his name being dropped. So, uh... I don't know why they wanted to go this other route, but the whole idea about the deep ones are in, they are immortal. Yeah. So that's, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, but they still, they're immortal, but they're not invincible. You can still kill them, but just given to their own devices, they can live forever. Like elves. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. Dagon and his fish people sail away to the unknown shores and what into the West. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so let's uh, that that as I said, that's the story. So let let's chit chat a little bit about the cast of this movie. Um, we talked about Ezra Godden, who is the not Jeffrey Combs of the film, and I I have a real mixed feeling about him. Sometimes he does things that I I really do like. Um, I do like the, the the cell phone thing, or you know the blinking thing, or there's one part where. Barbara's talking to the priest, in, both in Spanish. Of course, Paul doesn't know any Spanish. So he naturally thinks, no one here must know English. So he says right in front of the guy, I don't want you going with this guy because he kind of creeps me out. Yeah. And then the priest is like, I'm just going to take her to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, oh. <laughs> I, I do like him. I think that the character has some issues and he's, you know, real bad at getting away and stuff like that. But... I think the actor has a charm about him, and but I also am a big Jeffrey Combs fan, and maybe it's just yeah. that, maybe it's just that type. But then they also do stuff like, oh my god, this it always I I forget about it until I watch the movie again. But that whole thing, he just runs into the ground. Though there's two possibilities. Oh, I think that's kind of funny. <sighs> he says it like thirty times in this movie. <laughs> Like, every chance he gets, he, hey, 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 let me tell you about my two possibilities. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I I think he's a good enough stand-in for Jeffrey Combs, but he doesn't have any of the kind of quirks and eccentricities that make Jeffrey Combs such an interesting performer. Yeah. 
Uh, he, he's kind of fine, but, but he, he's sort of bland. I don't think the script is really doing him any favors either. Uh, no. You know, because he's, he's just getting caught all the time. And like you said, the repetition of, uh, uh, you know, two, two, options. two options over and over again. It's like, yeah, I, again, I get it, but... Mm, eh. Um... It, that, you know, that's kind of a bummer. Um, but uh, all things being equal, not not the worst offender in this movie. Um, I think that uh, Brendan Price, who plays Howard, and uh, Birgit Bofarul, uh, who plays Vicky, kind of non-entities. Yeah, but they don't get much to do. Yeah, I, I figured I would at least mention their names. Uh, Francisco Rabal, of course, as Ezekiel, who is... Um, if you watch uh, uh, some Pedro Almodovar films, he, he pops up in there. But he's a big star in Spain. It, like, started in 1942 and worked until, you know, he died in 2001. He died, you know, the, the film's dedicated to him and so forth. Like, he, he was, um, uh, died before the film came out. Um, but is, you know, a big star. And he's kind of you know, the most, like, schlocky fun in this movie with him spouting, like, he fucked him! You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I like him a lot. Yeah, I wish this movie had more of a spirit of that kind of thing, because it's a little overly serious at times. And you need a character like, you know, Ezekiel bouncing around to lighten the mood a little bit. And he's great. Uh, he's a terrific actor. Should have should have been in the movie more as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then we've got Barbara, played by Raquel Moronio. Moronio? Moronio, I think is how you pronounce that. Um, with the tilde over the N. But, uh, yeah, she's a, a, a famous um, actress in Spain as well. Did a lot of uh, soap operas and stuff. And she kind of reminded me of uh, Claudia Schiffer little bit yeah um and she uh, i wish she were in this more because she is kind of a, a spitfire in the film but mm -hmm. just every time she's about to do something really awesome she kind of disappears you know it's like the um uh that scene from the simpsons where homer is watching the one guy uh the the one like yakuza who doesn't do anything and uh, he's, you know, Marge is like, "Hey, we need to get in the house, in the house, so we don't get caught up in this gang fight." And he's like, "But Marge, that little guy over there hasn't done anything at all, and you know, when he does, it's going to be awesome." <laughs> <laughs> and that's kind of how I all felt about Barbara. Like, I wish the movie had followed her just a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I liked her a lot. Um. And then, I guess, kind of finally on my list of performers, it's uh, Macarena Gomez, who played Ushia uh, in this, the the princess fish lady. Um, and she's really striking looking. I don't know that I think her performance is great, but I think that she looks right for the part, you know, and not just because she's naked. <laughs> well, when you uh, when they do close ups of her face and you can see her eyes, she has really pretty green eyes, and I they're kind of mesmerizing because they're so uh, well. You said in the beginning she's doe eyed, and she is, she has like a a bit of a Mila Kunis thing going on with her big round eyes. But and I like it. Yeah, striking is a good word. Uh, she at least in this film has very pale skin. And I like the shape of her features. It's like she's just so do I. Classically pretty. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know if I am all about her performance necessarily. But I wonder if it may be uh, the language. I'm thinking know? that probably because again, uh, with the exception of Ezra and I think Brendan Price, uh, pretty much everybody here is Spanish. And who knows if English? I mean, well, obviously, Spain would be their first, or Spanish would be their first language. Um, yeah. So I wonder if maybe it's just, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, just the language and delivering the lines. You know, she, she does. She's not bad. It's just 
it's not, it doesn't blow me away. No. It's very one note. Everything is just, ah, yeah. you know, like she is delighted and menacing and that's it. And yeah. <laughs> and delightfully menacing and menacingly delightful. <laughs> yeah. And magically delicious. Um, well, ask him. <laughs> All right. Well, so enough about cast, I think. Let, let's move on to themes because I think this is where the conversation gets pretty interesting because you're dealing with um, very directly with, with some of the more interesting Lovecraftian themes. And I think this movie does a pretty good job of conveying that stuff. In, in, in particular, the idea that you are sort of the prisoner of your own genetics. That, yeah. you know, and because Lovecraft, uh, and, and Brian, you're going to have to correct me on this one, but my understanding is his mother had some kind of genetic disorder. Yeah, and it, both the mother and the father were insane. He had to go live with his aunts. I mean, he had a hard uh, and very uh, tragic upbringing. I think both of his parents died in asylums, yes. didn't they? And, uh, I mean, he was always sickly. Um, now, there's some debate. Uh, that could have been, uh, oh, what the hell is it? Hypochondriac? Thank you. <laughs> he could have been a hypochondriac, and uh, he didn't have many friends as a kid, and just... He was all messed up. I just imagine he was one of those bookish types yeah. that kept to himself and... And, you know, whatever. But, yeah, I think that that's a theme that runs heavily throughout his work is, well, and she says it multiple times. It's your destiny. It's mm -hmm. your destiny. It's your destiny. You can't, basically, it's the inescapableness of you are, this is going to happen to you. There's nothing you can do to stop well, it. Well, it's the idea of the taint, the unknown taint. It's that you have this thing inside you. And it's gonna. Yeah, I, I know. I was doing the same thing, Jamie. I'm, I, I'm not. I'm not mature enough to, to talk about I'm the end No, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, no. Brian, I apologize to you. You are the you adult in the, the room. Look, if you could see the look he's giving me right now, I'm sorry, baby. I'm sorry, but you know. <laughs> like, please continue. No, that's okay. You go ahead. No, no, no. I want no. No. Nope. I, I want to hear what you have to say about the taint. No, that's fine. It's, it's too hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, you're right. Uh, immaturity aside, that yeah, there there is this like this corrupt development. Like there's a, a bit of Cronenberg, or you know, probably the vice versa. Like there's a bit of Lovecraft and Cronenberg stuff, uh, where the, the the flesh will betray you. Yes. I mean, this is the essence of body horror. Your body, you're not in control of your body. And no matter what you want to do, your body has other ideas. And it's going to do what it's going to do, and you can't do anything to stop it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think, you, you know, like Jamie was saying, that it, there's this idea of free will versus destiny. There's this genetic element. And, um, and there's also, there's a, a sense of especially with the townspeople of Imboka, that they're basically willing to trade their humanity for money and success and also immortality. And I think that's kind of interesting too, of like, Oh, I don't need to be human if I can live forever. Like that's not, the, 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 that's the deal that they get, right? Like you can, you can worship Dagon and eventually your body will be corrupted, your mind to an extent, like they do all these, you know, really evil things, like capturing Paul over and over again, but also, uh, you know, taking these women and, and serving them up to Dagon to be, you know, brood mares for this cult. But again, that's kind of okay by them as long as that they can live forever and be... Initially, it's because they can be wealthy, and then it's because they can be these immortal creatures. Yeah, and I find it interesting that he offers to buy their way out. Paul offers them $10 million to let them all go. And the guy says, we have 
10 times that amount or that, I forget the, how much numbers he says, but he, <laughs> how much numbers? Oh go my on. God. Yes. Yes. My, my head brain is not working. Um, I forget what he says, <laughs> but we basically, we have way more than that. That's not going to do anything for us. And then you look at the town and it's disgusting. It's a shithole. It looks as if it, you know, has never seen anything but poverty. And Well, that's because, I mean, just look at these people. They got to stay isolated. They can't trade with any outsiders. Yeah, so what's the point of yeah, all the gold? Exactly. So they got all his gold and all his fish. What do we do with it? Now they just sit on it like dragons, yeah. I guess. But uh, I also, in this one in particular, see uh, some very interesting religious themes and like I particularly like well there are a couple of scenes one is when Ezekiel is telling the story about how all of this came to be and you see the townspeople going in and just ripping the church apart just tearing down uh, anything to do with Jesus and bashing it and then the priest comes in and tries to stop them and you know, he's just running around like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And then they end up, you know, sledgehammering him to death, which is brutal. And then they take everything down and put up, you know, all the signs of Dagon. And Well, that's because they finally got a god that delivers. Well, and that's, I was actually going to bring up what you said when we were watching the movie. And because I said, oh, because they're like, when, when Ezekiel's telling the story, he's like, you know, there were no, there was no fish. And so we prayed and we prayed. And Brian says, how'd that work out for you? And I said, well, I imagine as well as it usually does. Yeah. <laughs> and he, and then he's like, it's almost like there's no one listening. Yeah. And then, uh, and then of course the, he moves on in the story and talks about Dagon moving in. And then they just go through and rip everything down and put the Dagon stuff up. And then again, later I find it, very interesting that in in the moment when Ezekiel is having his face peeled off, he starts to recite the Lord's Prayer. Like, you have been living in this your entire life. He was just a young child when all of this came to pass, and they took his parents and sacrificed them. The prayers were never answered about the fish. His parents were taken and murdered. He has been living this horrible life all of this time, and now he's having his skin peeled off, and yet he still turns to God. And I just thought that was interesting. Well, he also says, we die as men. Yeah. That's something none of the other townsfolk can say. Yeah, They're not men true. anymore. Yeah. yeah. But I just think, I mean, at what point would you just say, all right, I guess there's nothing out there. Because nobody is helping me. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, in the end, he still turns to God. And I thought that I, I find that fascinating. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that's uh, there. I mean, you know, with, with them tearing down uh, the, the previous church and all the symbols of Catholicism and so forth. Like, you know, there's which if you think about that, too, I mean, the the Catholic churches uh, the old churches were built on previous worship sites yeah. of other deities, of other religions. And they would go in and raise those and bring up their own, the, the, you know, the churches to reflect their own faith. So it's kind of exactly the same thing. It is. And they would come in and they would kill the, the people. It was, and he says, Ezekiel says, you worship Dagon or you die. And that's exactly the way the church did it. You know, the church, <laughs> you know, but back in the day, they would move in. Either you come to this side or you die or you're a heretic. And that is a, like a one-to-one -one comparison. And if I recall correctly, Lovecraft did not love uh, organized religion. No, correct? he was a diehard yeah. atheist. Yeah. And, uh, Stephen King, who then is also a big Lovecraft fan, has taken a lot of those themes and moved them into his work. So that's something that continues to go on. But yeah, I, I just thought that was interesting, the, precisely the way that they portrayed it, because it is precisely the way 
that those churches originally came to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, right. It, it, like one of the things that you can say about the movie Dagon is there is meat on this bone. Uh, it, it, that meat will taste like fish, but there's meat on the bone. <laughs> and there's also this idea uh, of, of devolution in the film as well. This notion of like, you know, we came from the sea and that's where we're and going we're back. Going back. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, but I think it's really, you know, that's one of the reasons why as much as I goof on the movie, I still return to it a bunch because it, it deals with, you know, not just these Lovecraftian themes, but also gets into, uh, you know, it feels like S Stuart Gordon is saying his own thing with the movie, um, as, as well as, as getting into, uh, uh, the Lovecraftian themes and all right, let's, let's kind of bring this in for a landing a bit and, and talk about final thoughts and a score as always the score for this. Uh, we do five stars. We do allow half stars, but not quarter stars because we're not monsters. Um, and in particular, I'm kind of interested in, you know, where, not not just where this movie, you know, sort of lands in the grand sweep of Lovecraftian films and so forth, but, you know, what what is it about this movie in particular that seems to work in ways that other movies don't, um, but also uh, stumbles as well? So, uh, I'll shut up and you two decide which one of you uh, wants to go first. Ladies first. Oh, I was going to tell you to go first. No, go I ahead. owe you after that tank thing. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, uh, it, it this film tends to be frustrating for me because I know what Stuart Gordon is capable of and I see what, like you said, there are meat on these bones and if he had been allowed, if he had been given the budget that he needed to make what he was envisioning, I think that it would have been right up there uh, with, you know, his reanimator is from beyond, you know, two films I absolutely love. Because of that, though, because it was hamstrung as much as it was, it's unfortunate that I can't love this one. I do really like it, though. I, I see what's there. Also, like I said in the beginning, Innsmouth is my favorite story. So uh, any time you can kind of portray the setting i think he did really well the fish people i think he did really well the all the practical effects look great it's just that you can see the budgetary limitations here but still i am drawn in by those themes particularly the religious ones which tend to pull at me uh, on a personal level i that's i always gravitate toward uh, religion and horror films i just find it fascinating and so for all those reasons, it mostly works for me. You know, the, the things that don't work about it are just the things that are caused by budgetary limitations. But other than that, I'm okay with it. I do think that the, I wish that maybe the script were a little stronger. Maybe some of the dialogue was a little more, had a little more flair to it, or maybe was a, a more interesting and a better score. Uh, but all of that being said, I still come away with a four for this one. And that is, you know, that's relatively high. I tend to be generous though, when I, particularly when I'm drawn to a film. Um, his other two films are both fives for me. His other two Lovecraftian films are, are both fives for me, but this one is slightly under that, but I do still really like it. Yeah, for me, the biggest problem is the budget and how it gets in the way. If they could have done this how they originally wanted to do this with all their plans and ideas, and it, I think it, could have, it would have been a much better film. But I always say you can't judge a movie on what could have been, what should have been. You got to judge it on what you got. And what we got here is still good. Now, I could be a bit biased because I am a huge Lovecraft fan, and... While this movie misses a few beats, by and large, it 
captures at least the essence of what Lovecraft wanted to do with the story. So I like that. And I like the look of it. I mean, this is a very insmouth looking Imboka. And I like how the inhabitants are always shuffling and crawling and dragging themselves around. The garbly speech, I really yeah. love Yeah, or that. like, and they have like, oh, what is that? Like clicking or, you know, mm -hmm. they sound like dolphins <laughs> sometimes. Just, they have all these weird sea sounds to them. And I love the flashback scene of showing how the town rebelled against, you know, the church and took up this new religion. And how, I mean, that's right from the story, too. Yeah, it began with, hey, we can get fishes and we can get gold. And then it was like, oh, wait, now we want babies. And it just, it's, it was slowly pushed on them until only Ezekiel was left alive. And, you know, human. I, Ezra is a real mixed bag for me, as I said, because he's our main character. And some of the stuff he does, I really like. And sometimes I think he's pretty funny. Other times, he's just grown in Dune scene, and I don't get that at all with uh, the previous Stuart Gordon movies and their characters, like any of them. I think that's, well, because <laughs> this guy's no Jeffrey Combs. Yes. That's probably, that's probably yeah. But even like Barbara Crampton, even, um, oh, what was the guy who played uh, his roommate, Dean? Um, hell, you get Bubba from... Uh, <laughs> From beyond, I mean, the, the cast in those two films, I just think are stronger. And I I don't know why, but I can, I enjoy watching all those characters doing what they do. And here, it's passable, but it doesn't really inspire me. I, I, I am never like, yeah, that's a, you know, that's a good character or something like that. I'm just like, yeah. No okay. one's going to make, uh, like, a collectible figurine out of... Paul. No. You know, <laughs> like that's not, you're not gonna, you're gonna find Herbert West. We have one on the shelf. Yes. You're not gonna find a Paul. You know, it's just, there's nothing that remarkable about him. Um, one of the biggest nails in the coffin for me is the woeful CGI. I really don't like that. Uh, you know like, that part where she goes skittering across the floor toward him after he like lights himself on fire uh -huh. and you get her uh, she jumps out of her chair and then goes like pentacle walking over yeah. there. That looks so bad. It's so bad. I just, it, uh, I'm embarrassed for it. It's yeah. so bad. I mean, it just, like Bo said, instead of having big CGI Dagon come up at the end, just have some, you know, make some foam latex tentacles. Use those. I mean. Hell, use that octopu octopus from Ed Wood. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but all said and done, I still do really like this movie. It still mostly hits the marks that I would want to see hit in this story. And uh, I give it a 4 out of 5. Alright, well you guys are way nicer than me. Uh, well that's unusual for him. Usually I'm the very generous one and he tends to be... It's also Lovecraft. I know, and yeah. that's, that's what I was going to say. Is I could be biased. <laughs> But that is, yeah, I actually kind of am surprised that he ranked it as high as he did. But I get it, though, because Lovecraft. Yeah. Well, what about you, Bo? Um, I, yeah, I, this is a movie I return to m more than I probably would if it were not for the fact that I really do enjoy Lovecraft. Um, it, it gets a lot right. Um, I think it is kind of disappointing that this wasn't done uh, as it was originally pitched, you know, in, in 85 when, you know, Stuart Gordon is coming off of Reanimator and has his mojo and, you know, this was going to be a pre from beyond kind of thing. And instead, um, you know, the money just wasn't there for it. And I would have liked to have seen it done even on the cheap uh, I, I would like to see kind of Stuart Gordon in his prime and not hamstrung by budget and working with an all Spanish crew and, and all of that stuff because I do think that the cheapness of this movie um, undercuts some of the really good stuff about it but that said the good stuff really does work for me it's just that I have to give a lot of 
if I'm recommending this to, to someone, there's a fair amount of asterisks of like, okay, this is going to be, you know, Brian Yuzna, Stuart Gordon style. Like this is over the top gore. There's a lot of nudity. There's, uh, it, you know, it, it doesn't quite get the camp of From Beyond and Reanimator right because it's just telling a more serious story. And I think maybe I miss that a little bit, even though I don't want this movie to be campy. I, I wish it had a little more, you know, joie de vivre in the, in the telling of this story. Uh, but I like it. And I would, I would give this a solid three. You catch me on the right day, maybe a three and a half. Um, I, I think that's fair, but, but I do like, I enjoy it. Um, and, and I've spent a lot of time with it recently, of course, uh, getting ready for this show and I've enjoyed that time. And, and part of it too, I think is just the, the nostalgia of listening to Stuart Gordon talk about his movies. Uh, I just, I, I like him. I like him as a director. Um, I had an opportunity to speak with him on the phone years and years ago and he was like so gracious and nice and. Uh, I yeah I I, I like uh, Stuart Gordon a lot and I like the fact that he got to make this movie even if it's kind of imperfect. Um, so let's get to the informational en- enough enough John about our opinions. Let's get to some hardcore facts. Uh, these are three things that you may not know about the uh, the movie Dagon. Uh, the first is that the the name of the town itself in Boca is uh it actually means in's mouth uh boca means mouth and uh m is short for in so you get i didn't know that (laughs) in's in's mouth uh is in boca so nice yeah that's cool you know uh again Stuart gordon having a little fun um the uh there was going to be a scene where the townspeople summon the storm that that uh, shipwrecks uh, Paul and crew um, that was originally cut from the script. It, it was never shot or anything, but in the original script, like that storm that suddenly blows up, you were going to see these cult members of Dagon summoning that storm forth, um, which I think kind of would have been fun. I think it yeah. you know it would have tipped the hand and, and all that, but that's fun. Uh, you know, having Dagon work for the town instead of the town working for Dagon for once. <laughs> um, and uh, here's two that are kind of in the same ballpark. Uh, we talked about this originally going to be uh, a, a 1985 movie uh, as a follow-up to the Reanimator, the Reanimator, as a follow-up to Reanimator. And Charles Band was the one who kind of put the kibosh on that. Because he said, like, oh, that's too ridiculous. And... Oh. Right. <laughs> Charles Band said that. <laughs> Not enough puppets. But wait a minute. Didn't Charles Band produce The Resurrected? Mm. I know that his brother did the music for it. but I th- So I thought it was a full moon. Or a... I don't think so. Hmm. Um, yeah, this could all be right. a whole Kraken thing all over again. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I know his brother, uh, Richard, I think. Uh, Richard Band is the music guy. I think I know he did the music, but I was so I was thinking it was a Charles Band production because he, you know, they they work together a lot. But man, I didn't realize Dan O'Bannon directed that. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And if you if you pay attention to the special effects, you can see that uh, they are very similar. Some of the creatures, you know, the whatever they are, the, reanimated the, things. Yeah, the the dead the. the Re- yeah, the reanimated things in that film look very similar to the effects in Return of the Living Dead. Oh wow! Yeah, sure enough, not uh, Richard Band did the music. Charles Band nowhere, nowhere on nope. the movie. Okay, but I was right about Richard, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's crazy. I need it. I don't think I've ever seen that. I need to catch up to that. I'm. I'm oh my god! Yeah. Well, you're a bit. You're a big Chris Randon fan, right? I am a big Aren't Chris, Chris yeah, Randon yeah. fan. I think you will love him in that. He, it is. He's so good. He's uh, so good. It will be a damnable, damnable. mess. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, one 
Uh, final thing that you may not know about Dagon. Um, uh, Brian Yuzna was the one who was like, hey, don't call this movie Shadow Over Ant's Mouth because that's too clunky. So he was the one who said, I, and the way he said it, it made me think like, Brian Yuzna is not the brains of this outfit. No. Uh, because he said, you know, I want to call it Dagon because it's shorter and, and snappier. Also, it kind of sounds like Dragon. Oh, my lord. Yeah. And it's like, uh, just leave Stuart Gordon alone. Yeah. Let now, me... <laughs> well, yeah, because uh, Yuzna is the one who did, um, uh, what was that Lovecraftian, the, the anthology? Oh, the Necronomicon. Yeah. yeah. And. That's bad. He missed the mark a <laughs> lot. It's that. fun. I mean, yeah, it has its, its fun moments and all, but he, yeah. Uh, you you watch that movie and you go, damn, Stuart Gordon should have done this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Did either of you guys watch uh, the, it was that Netflix comedy series, I Think You Should Leave? Uh, no, no I but I so. like the title. I, I can't recommend it enough. It's a great sketch comedy show. But when I think about the movie Necronomicon, there's a sketch about uh, a guy doing one of those um, uh, like reality shows where you get dressed up in, you know, this latex mask and a full costume and that kind of thing that changes your appearance. Kind of a bad grandpa sort of thing. And go out into the mall just to fuck with people. <laughs> Except the makeup is just horrible and it's too thick. And he's wearing <laughs> these gloves that make his hands look really misshapen. And he just doesn't look like a person anymore. <laughs> and as he's in the mall, he's talking to the crew in the van. And he's just like, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> this is stupid. I can't. I can't fucking breathe in this. <laughs> and so when I think of Jeffrey Combs as Lovecraft in yeah. Necronomicon, <laughs> that's what I think of now. Is just him covered. I'm just like I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but anyway, all that to say, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for coming on to talk about Dagon. Well, uh, thank you for for having us. I mean. I get to talk to you a lot, but Brian doesn't. No, that was a lot of fun. Thanks for often. inviting us in. And uh, before I cut you guys loose, please uh, talk about the the podcast that you do and where people can find that. And and Brian, be sure to uh, sell your wear some more because um, it, it's all, like I am so genuinely impressed and blown away by not just that you've done all this work with Call of Cthulhu, but that. It's like it has been beloved by the community, and that's got to be awesome. So, uh, please pimp it. Oh, thank you. Uh, pimp our show first, I guess. Uh, well, our show is Horror in the House of Salmons, and you can find us anywhere that you find podcasts. And uh, that's pretty much it. I mean, the, we have it, it's <laughs> well in three <done>. segments. <laughs> the the first segment is we get, we go through the alphabet and we each bring um a movie that we want to talk about or that either we think doesn't get talked about enough or maybe really obscure it's not it's not necessary that it's obscure sometimes it's just something we want to talk about and uh th that is the abc's of hidden horror portion of the show then we do a bumps in the night where we talk about anything from paranormal experiences to our favorite zombie movies that aren't Romero and uh, I mean that was a fun that was a fun one to do but let me tell you we had to put a lot of caveats in there it was like all right well we're gonna do our top 10 favorite zombie movies but they can't be Romero movies they can't be um, infected movies they have to be uh, undead like, zombies. undead and come back to life and then, like by the time we got it finished explaining all the rules for it <laughs> it was probably like 15 minutes into the segment but that was a fun one to do. So we basically talk about anything there. And then the third segment is us going through our collection and where we just, we're going through our collection alphabetically. And um, then we do brief like run throughs of how we feel about each movie. And that's horror or non-horror. The majority of our collection is horror. I'd say easily in the 90 percentile, but we do have other stuff too, and so that gives us the opportunity to kind of talk about a everything. whole bunch of ninja movies, <laughs> yeah, nice. and monkey detective movies. Unfortunately, <laughs> but anyway, that's horror in the House of Salmons, and uh, we have a great time. 
we're coming up on the one year anniversary of that show being that format. And um, uh, it'll be May 13th will be the one year anniversary of that. And I've had a great time doing it with this format. I think we've had yeah. a lot of fun. So yeah, check nice. it out if you haven't. And happy anniversary. Well, I think. Oh, thank you. Uh, as far as me, uh, the thing that I most recently did is me and my partner, uh, Glenn Barris, he's over in the UK. We've done a bunch of work together, both Call of Cthulhu stuff and fiction work. We've done stories together. We've edited anthologies together. He's pretty much my right-hand man. And uh, we just finished up our latest anthology. It's called Mystery Murder madness mythos mm. and it's lovecraftian murder mystery type. it's like agatha christie meets lovecraft or you know dashiell hammett or any of that any type of legit mystery combined with legit lovecraftian horror and this will be coming out from ps publishing they're also in the uk and they put out excellent books and uh we just sent that off, so I don't know exactly when is it coming out, but I'm I'm looking forward to it. Excellent, man. Um, again, thanks very much, uh, and uh, we'll we'll do this again soon, as soon as we come up with a good reason to. So, uh, all right, I'll be <laughs> right back to close out the show. All right, folks, there you have it. That is the final episode of may uh what is coming up you may ask yourself well uh, an entire season that i am calling universal where we look at some uh, classic universal horror films sure we're gonna do some of the monster stuff but not just the monster stuff there's uh, a movie or two in there that i want to talk about because i don't hear them talked about very much and and i feel like they ought to be so uh, I'm going to leave that alone. I, I want it to be a little bit of a surprise anyway. So uh, thanks again for joining me this May for uh, all these aquatic horrors. Uh, I think you're going to enjoy Universal. Uh, that is going to be a, a five episode season because of June having five Wednesdays in it and all. Uh, so get ready for that. I know uh, <laughs> I was surprised to learn that too. Uh, as it happens, as I was doing my scheduling, but uh, I'm I'm looking forward to it. It's got to be a lot of fun. Uh, a couple of those are already in the uh, in the can, as they say, uh, as I record this, and it, it's going to be a good season. So, uh, thanks again for listening. Thanks for uh, rating, reviewing, sharing the show. All of that stuff really helps. Uh, and if you can take a couple of minutes out of your day uh, to do such a thing, that's it means the world to me. And Certainly helps with the profile of the show, uh, which I, I strangely work fairly hard on as it happens. Um, so, you know, if you want to reward me, that's the way to do it. Uh, so, oh, you can also uh, chit chat with, with all of us here um, on uh, the Dark Parade. You can go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Dark Parade. Uh, on Twitter, I am at Dark Parade Pod. Uh, and I, I gotta tell you, we've got an Instagram too. I think I don't, I don't even look at that. I am not a social media person. Uh, I find it, uh, disconcerting, uh, as, as I've said before, I don't know a whole lot of people that spend a lot of time on social media and come away from it thinking, boy, I feel better. So I tend to stay away from that, but, uh, I do like to hear from you guys. Uh, I do check the social media about once a day. So um, if you want to leave me a message there, please do. I will get it. I promise. And I will get back to you. Uh, and if I haven't gotten back to you, send me another message. Um, but if you want to find me where, uh, I, I do interact with, uh, a lot more frequency, um, you can find the discord group. If you go to legionpodcasts.com forward slash the dash dark dash parade then you uh, you will get to the homepage of the Dark Parade over on legionpodcast.com. And there you can do fun things like uh, sign up for the Discord and find links to the Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff, as well as the entire back catalog of the show. Uh, so if you want to catch up, if you're new to the show and want to listen to the old stuff, uh, the old stuff, as, uh, we haven't been doing this a year yet, so it's not that old. But coming up on it, it turns out episode 34, closer to episode 52 than not, 
that's kind of cool. So uh, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know what I'm going to do for the year anniversary yet. I'm still thinking about it. Um, oh, also, uh, you can find a GoFundMe link there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am going back to school uh, to get a license to teach here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, a lot of gnarly legislation has been passed to make uh, public education uh, a little more difficult, a little more challenging, uh, a little more restrictive. And, uh, you know, I thought it would be time to put my money where my mouth is and not just complain about it. So I'm going to uh, dive into the trenches. But that means i got to go back to school and get some licensing done. And uh, if you want to help, uh, there's a link to the GoFundMe there. Uh, I would appreciate it. Uh, certainly don't have to, but, uh, you know, a couple of coins in the jar certainly would help. Because uh, I'm, you know, trying to come out of this with a, as few loans as possible to, to get this done. Turns out school teachers don't make a lot of money, as it happens. Um, <laughs> at any rate, uh, enough about all of that. Thanks very, very much for listening to the show. We got a whole slate of Universal uh, horror movies coming up next month. I hope you join us for that. If you are listening to this on Wednesday when the public feed hits, uh, you can always catch these episodes a couple of days early on patreon.com forward slash legion podcasts. If, uh, if you need your dark parade to come to your town just a little sooner, uh, you can find early access to all the episodes there. But if you're listening to this on Wednesday on Friday, uh, Lord willing and the Creek don't rise. We are going to have, uh, an episode of heart of horror that I've been promised by Kate Pollock is going to be more shocking than uh, the one that included the story of Mentos. And if you haven't heard that one, you need to go back to the, the Heart of Horror episodes and, uh, and, and get some K. Pollock in your life. That is it for now. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks so much for sharing the show around. Thanks for rating, reviewing. And thank you, as always, for joining the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time. <laughs>